And thank you so much for uh, having me here. Thanks so much for uh, coming out here on a Friday night when it's kind of rainy. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm here to talk to you tonight about SVG for Complex Responsive Animation. That's kind of a mouthful, but we'll break it down. Don't worry. Um, my name is Sarah Drasner. This is a photo of me as a child and also my relationship to authority. Um, I am a consultant and staff writer at CSS Tricks, if you've ever been there before. Um, and I do, you know, projects for a lot of people all over the place, Microsoft, IBM, all sorts of stuff. Um, mostly working on stuff like the stuff I'm going to uh, show you tonight. So probably if you're here tonight, you know why SVG is awesome, but just in case you don't and you need a little refresher, um, SVG is crisp on any display. It's built with math. So that means that there's no kind of pixelation ever. You don't have to do image replacements. It's just always crisp. It's never something that you have to worry about. And because it's crisp on any, every display and it's built with math, there's less HTTP requests to handle. You don't have to do cut up a, bu cut, cut a bunch of images for picture or source set. Um, you don't even have to have any HTTP. HTTP requests, um, that's a mouthful, um, because you can put it directly in line. Um, when we move to HTTP2, then it won't be such an issue, but for now, that's really, really awesome. Um, it's easily scalable for responsive. It's in the name, scalable vector graphics. Um, I'm going to show you exactly how you can scale it for responsive and like a lot of cool tricks that you can do, um, but you don't even have to get tricky with it. You can actually just use them as they are, and they're just wonderful. Um, it's a really small file size if you de design for performance. If you design for performance is a pretty big part of that statement. So we'll go over a couple of things to help you do that as well. Um, it's really easy to animate, which we're going to do a lot of tonight. It has a navigable DOM. That means you can just reach right inside of it, grab pieces of it, and move them around. It's really malleable. And that's really awesome, because that means that you don't have to do any like crazy positioning hacks to get things to work. Uh, it's just there for you. Um, because it has a navigable DOM, it's easy to make accessible. I'll teach you a little bit about that, too. It, it really is like pieces of your document. You can have it be like role of presentation and go over the whole thing, or you can actually manipulate pieces of it for screen readers and make uh, certain pieces of information available. So that's really nice. And it's fun. Like, remember fun? Fun was good. We like fun. Um, so I, I like talking about SVG because I just think it's such a party, you know? You can like make a party with SVG and manipulate it, or you know, you can have JavaScript be the event coordinator with, for you, you know, event. Get it? It's a bad dad joke. Um, there's more where those came from. OK. <laughs> um, sometimes when I do consultant work, um, I find that people think that SVG isn't very well supported. It actually is. I know it wasn't very so well supported a few years ago, but it's actually really, really well supported. This is actually showing that IE 11 is green. It goes all the way back to IE 9. Um, I don't know why they only highlighted the green there, but even Opera Mini. We never get Opera Mini. This is awesome. So um, if you're not using SVG because you're worried about support, please don't. Um, so we're also, we're also going to talk about animation. And that's like another one where we're like, why are we talking about this? Animation's really powerful to convey meaning. If you have a page and you have really, really strongly colored buttons, still the, the thing that's going to draw your attention most is going to be something in motion. And because of that, it can really guide your users. It's extremely powerful that way. It's also easy to do wrong. So we have to kind of talk about like some of the responsible things to do in animation and maybe, you know, take Make it easy if it's not the star of the show. It's just kind of there to aid in UX choreography. Um, also, because otherwise we're not using the web to its full potential. The web is more than just a static, bright box. There's so much we can do with it, especially if we have graphics that are built in math that we can move around and like completely um, are and are completely malleable. Again, it's fun. Remember fun? Fun's fun. Um, so when I talk about UI UX animation, um, I'm talking about moving pieces of the UI and parts um, to create U UI choreography. Every piece works together and um, works in this like really, really nice relationship together. It can conserve space. So what's nice about it is that you don't have to scan all of the elements on the page at once. You can have things hide and show as you need them. So par parts of your UI can come when called. Or it can live on its own. Mm -hmm. 
So I, um, I actually made this pen, but Sarah Sweden showed this at a conference once and asked all the introverts to raise their hand, and nobody raised their hand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you're here, you're probably um, concerned about performance, and you should be. There's lots of ways to make an SVG. You can uh, draw them with JavaScript. You can write them by hand. You can also make them in Illustrator or Sketch or something like that. And if you're doing the last one, which is probably the most common use case, you really need to worry about optimization. Or not worry, but think about it. Um, so when you're using one of those tools, in Illustrator, I really suggest you use export as instead of save as. That gives you much better um, tools for the job. Dmitry Baranovsky, who, the guy who wrote uh, Snap SVG, actually built that tool. That's why it's so good. Um, so that's a really, really good tool for it. But you should still optimize further. Um, SVG OMG is a web-based GUI built by Jake Archibald. It rests off of SVGO, the terminal-based GUI below. And what's really nice about it is that you, I'm not a big fan of like animation GUIs or code GUIs, but you do need to see how your code is being exported with an SVG because the way that you decide to merge paths and optimize can change the way that it looks. So seeing what you're doing is really, really important. It has a lot of toggles and stuff, so there's tons of options. Um, I really like that. I also really like Peter Collinridge's SVG editor. It's kind of like an old Rails app and stuff, but it has like an you know experimental edit tab that's been experimental for five years. Um, I, I think it's still really great. Um, if you prefer to work in your terminal, totally cool. SVGO has you covered. There's also the pairing of SVGO GUI. I suggest you put those two together if you're going to work with that workflow. Um, I also wrote a post called High Performance SVGs that gives like every nerdy, nitty gritty detail about working with SVGs and getting them to be a sm fall, uh, small file size that I can't, details that I can't get into tonight because of the lack of time. Um, so if you're interested in much more nerdy information, you can always go there. So before we get started, let's talk about animation performance. People expect mobile to be faster than web. If you're a web developer, that makes no sense. <laughs> but people think that websites are tiny little websites on their phone. Um, so if you're going to be doing things with, for responsive, we have to think about performance, animation performance, and also those SVG performance. Um, so we're going to make things really nice and small, and we're also going to make them as performant as possible. Um, I suggest using things with transforms and moving things with transforms and opacity. Um, that is like causes the le least amount of uh, layout recalculations and repaints. Um, there's more information about that on jankfree.org. I also wrote an article call, uh, on CSS Tricks called Weighing SVG Animations with Benchmarks, where I rewrote the same animation over and over again with different tools and, um, and like, did uh, visual benchmarks and timeline benchmarks. What I found was that one tool that we're going to talk about a lot today, GreenSock, had performance that was as good or better than native technologies. I'm going to say that again because I think it bears repeating. It had as good or better performance than native technologies. That's really hard to do. Um, so um, that, that post is old. It's like a couple years old now, which is like dinosaur ages on the web. So definitely run your own tests. But that's part of the reason why I started using GreenSock. Um, you can vote on support. Um, SVG DOM nodes are not able to be hardware accelerated in Chrome, but they can be hardware accelerated in Firefox. So if you want to help support me in getting it into Chrome, you can go there and vote on it, and you definitely should. Um, and then IE doesn't support CSS transforms on um, SVG DOM nodes at all, so that's like low-hanging fruit of the web, and you definitely you have to go there. You have to um, and vote on that. Um, so above all else, test things yourself. Always be running tests and comparing technologies. Um, not all things are created equal. We talked a little bit about how opacity and transforms are better than you know, other kinds of moving things with top and left and margin and stuff. Um, if you're bummed out because transforms is just one property, transforms offers you t so many things. You can rotate, you can skew. Most of the demos that I'm going to be showing you tonight are just using transforms and opacity. So don't feel too bummed out about that. Um, you can also hardware accelerate by using an, a mix-in like this or writing something yourself. If you don't like mix-ins, that's OK. Um, you, can do <laughs> you, uh, you can do what we call the uh, null transform hack, which is transform translate z0, backface visibility 
Accessibility Hidden, Perspective 1000, and that will hardware accelerate um, any kind of units you're using, not just SVG divs as well. Um, there's a couple resources here. I wrote one called Debugging Keyframe Animations, and there's another one called High Performance Animations. And if you don't believe me, Netflix also does these kind of hardware accelerations on some of the things that you've probably seen if you use Netflix. Um, there's some people from Netflix here in the back. Hey! Um, <laughs> and there's the source, um, uh, the case study on Wealthfront. So when I say scalable, what do I mean? This is me bringing an SVG over to um, o over it, like directly in line into an HTML. I know it's super small, I'm gonna explain what's happening. I'm pulling the width and height out and you can see it expands to fill the entire screen. It will just expand to fill whatever container if it doesn't have a width and height on it. You do need a view box on unit on there, but usually you'll already have that. And then from there I can say like, width 100 uh, viewport width and height is 100 viewport height and it will just be directly in the middle of that container and scale up and down and be beautiful and perfect if that's all that's going on. Um, if it's not all that's going on, I've got you covered. I'm about to cover that in just a second. So if we're gonna make something like a responsive SVG animation sprite. Here's the desktop view. So like, let's say we're like illustrating an article and we wanna have like an initial letter illustration where we have like a capital A and we have all the text that follows. So here we have like the desktop view and there's that A and a few things that I'm gonna animate. Then we've got the tablet view, which is like a slightly different color. It's a little bit less complex. And then for mobile view, we have like the least complex. Um, if I'm, you know, designing this, I'm actually gonna dry out my design the same way that you dry out your code. I'm going to make a sprite out of it, and I'm going to make sure that I have all of these units, like anything that can be repeated, I will repeat, and then anything that doesn't repeat, I'll put classes of desktop or tablet so I can hide and uh, show them, and then I have the mobile view lower. So then when we have this pen, When it's scaling down, it's completely changing to tablet and mobile. That whole animation and SVG and everything, the text, everything, was eight kilobytes cheesipped. Compare that to using like bitmaps and images for your articles. We're not t just saying that SVG is cool. We're saying that it can be more performant than some of the bitmaps that you're already using and more engaging. Um, and we can do really, really cool stuff like make it completely different for all of these different devices. So basically what we did, if we go back here, is we're shifting that view box we have a view box that's kind of like a, a window or a canvas that we're looking at and we're shifting it all to the, to the bottom frame. So if I look at that in JavaScript, we're just listening to that match media on that window change and then we're just gonna shift that view box property. This will eventually go into CSS. Jake Archibald also put this a bug for this in Chrome um, that, that's pr like a proposal. I should have put a link in there so you could go vote on that as well. Um, so eventually you might be able to use a media query for this or something, um, and that would be really cool. But for now, this is pretty simple. But I said complex, and that's not really that complex, so let's go a little bit deeper. But we're gonna need green sock, and I'll tell you why. I don't work for them, by the way, I just like this tool. I think like, that's pr probably pretty important to say I'm not like a marketing ploy or something. Um, it solves cross-browser inconsistencies. Remember I just said that like IE doesn't support CSS transforms at all? That's IE just like chilling there like, nah, I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> if so if you're gonna do something like really, really simple and like you just wanna use CSS, that's okay, it just falls back to an image, no big deal. But some of these other you know, browser transform issues can be really such a headache. You're just like, Firefox, really? Why? Um, and when you use GreenSock, you don't have to worry about any of these, any of them. There's other transform issues, there's other transform origin issues, so um, just Based on the spec, the way that the spec is interpreted, it will jump around if you move the transform origin like con uh, consecutively and keep on animating. So if you see the way that they do this like smooth origin under the hood, it actually does what you'd visually expect it to do. So you don't have to worry about that either, which is really nice. 
It also has a timeline. I think the timeline is the coolest thing, and I'll show some demos for that. You can stack tweens. You can set them a little bit before and after one another. You can change their placement in time. You can group them into scenes. You can add relative labels, so you can have a label on the, on the playhead and have a bunch of things burst off of that. Um, at the same time, you can animate the scenes. That means you can animate your animations. Um, you can make the whole thing faster, change the placement of the whole scene. You can nest them. So you can make your code as clean and precise and easy to manage as humanly possible, all without recalculation. So the issue with some CSS animations that I have is that if you do something that's like really, really sufficiently complex, you're having to layer all of those with delays, right? You're doing one animation and then you're like, you know, do another one and you chain them and then you'd use the delays. So then somebody comes along and they say, oh, you know, that first part just it looks like it was like a little bit too slow then you got to go back and like redo everything that came before it you don't have to do that with JavaScript um, another issue is let's say you want something to happen like midway through and you have something that happens at like the 60 percent mark and something else that happens at the same mark you have to like recal then recalculate all the percentages as well it's kind of a headache um, so doing that without re recalculate recalculation is a really big deal actually I'm gonna put this in full screen so you can see it better. So if I have this animation and I have that middle part firing a few times in the course of the thing, you can see that I can put, wrap that in a function and I can actually reuse that animation. So then that's on the playhead here, here, and here. And then I have this one other part that's wrapped in a function and it goes here. And I'm like narrating it for you, but you can actually see it. Um, <laughs> then it's, this part is, it fires here. And then the last part will go in that space. So then what if I want to reorder it? All I have to do is change the order, just move one line of code, and then the whole thing plays in a different order. And then if I want to make the whole thing faster, I can also do that in one line of code. That's pretty powerful. If you're going to make anything that's like beyond like a few movements, it's really, really a powerful tool. It has other really cool things for complex animation. Motion on, along a path, it has the widest support. So Smile used to be pretty good for motion along a path, but it's getting deprecated. It's moving into CSS slowly. <laughs> um, so right now, actually, it offers you the widest support back to IE8. It has things like draggable, CSS properties, draw SVG. You can make a, an SVG look like it's drawing itself onto the screen. Morph SVG. This is probably the best. Um, I try every single library and every single plugin for everything. Um, this one is the best because it can take uneven amounts of path points and tween them, and I'll show you some cool things for that. Uh, relative color tweening, cycle stagger. So I hate live coding, so I made this monster to live code for you. Um, <laughs> and he's going to show you how to build tw tweens and timelines. So he's going to move his eyes. That's how I make the eye move. And then if there's two tweens, he's going to actually move his antennas, but they're going to fire at the same time. But if I want to put them on a timeline, all I do is change it to TL and var, var TL and hang it off of there. And now they follow each other. So now if I want to make it a little bit more organized, I can wrap it in a function, add it to a master timeline so it's not on global scope. And then I can make another function with a different timeline and add that to the master wherever I want. That's going to flap his wings. Pretty cool. <laughs> now he's going to say goodbye to you. Bye. OK. <laughs> So um, we can make scalable graphics and scalable animations. So one cool thing about SVGs is we talked about how they can be squishy and how they can be malleable and like kind of scale to their container. Because we're working inside of a coordinate system, so will the animation. The animation's also going to be scalable. So if you have animation where you're moving it this much to the left, you don't have to refactor it or put in media queries or anything to make it a little bit less on mobile. It's going to scale along with that animation. So that's really, really cool. Um, another thing that, that GreenSock does really well is percentage-based transforms, which kind of help with that. But you don't even need it, really. So I'll let it play once, and then I'll have it replay.
So if I have it replay, I can click it to randomly resize it, and you can see the animation say is totally stable no matter what size it is. That's really, really nice. But it necess doesn't necessarily have to be fluid either. Like most of our UIs aren't just like they actually have like responsive design in them. So let's do some more like designing interaction and in responsive animations. So if we have this pen and we have um, like a desktop view of the Huggy Laser Panda Factory, um, you know, like you have in real life, like Huggy Laser Panda Factories. Um, so so we have this desktop view where like this section is an SVG, this section is the same SVG. This section is the same SVG, but it's flipped and like it slots into that place. And then this one goes here so that they kind of stack and reorganize on mobile, kind of like Legos. Um, so if we look at this pen, oh, don't come up, please. So we have this factory, and that one's going to make him lasered, and that one's going to make him pandaed, and that one's going to make him huggy. And then as we scale it down to mobile, it all still works. I've checked this on like Windows and Android devices and everything, and it all still works on mobile. So what we have here is we have a repeated animation for all of those sections. We have just one thing that's going to keep on firing. We have like little bubbles coming up and gears and things that keep going. Um, and then uh, we'll have like a function that we kind of like have for all, the whole, I call it paint panda function. And then we're going to pause it initially. And then just on a click event for a piece of that SVG, because remember, we can dive into that in, inside the SVG, we can trigger it to restart. So that's really, really nice. You can have little pieces of it restart. Now, my design and my animation and all of my functions are kind of scoped to the same thing. If I change something in the like painted panda SVG in the design, I'm going to go right to the same place in the code. It makes it really, really easy and organized to, to think about. Um, but I think something that's kind of overlooked when people talk about animation on the web or do animation on the web is atmosphere. It's kind of like not something that people really uh, pay attention to, but every time you look around in, the real, in real life, you see atmosphere, it's part of something that you're seeing. So it's not just like um, you know, an afterthought, it's, it, it is actually like a character in your animation. It's a really important character in your animation. So let's talk about elemental motion very quickly. Um, things that are further away from you are less in less contrast and they're a little bit blurrier, so you have to make your animations look that way. Um, you have to ask yourself if the air or environment around you is affecting the movement. If you reduce precision, it allows you to understand something. So I'll show you what I mean by that. If I'm going to animate that smoke, that's kind of like, you know, a little bit maybe hard to do. Like, where, where do I start? I don't even know. But if I reduce the precision there, I start to notice some patterns. Like, I can see kind of like there, maybe there's like little balls in there that maybe I can actually move around. And then actually, like, if I think about it, what's happening is those little balls are moving out, and then the air or wind around them is pushing them back in. So they're kind of moving out and then kind of coming back together. Now that I can animate. So if we're putting some techniques together, we can use Morph SVG from GSAP. Um, one thing that's cool about Morph SVG, and I kind of mentioned, I'm going to show you a demo in a second that uses this, but one thing that's worth mentioning before we even dive into that is you can use an uneven amount of path points, but you can also pick the type of path point precision that you want. So here is like their auto, but if I go around, you can see if I pick a different point to execute, that Morph SVG, it'll actually totally change the animation. It changes the character of the animation. It changes like the whole way it works. So if we look at this pen, this is a candle I made in SVG. And I kind of showed this one because I think SVG, people think that it has to look like SVG -y and very vectory, um, and that it can't be like this living, breathing thing. Um, but because it's built with math, there's so many things that we can do with it, and it has so many potential, um, so much potential. So when I built this, what I did was just draw like a few simple shapes and put gradients on them. And then that one, that circle in the background kind of gets bigger and smaller. And I made these blue so that you can see them a little bit better. They're just a bunch of flame shapes and little pieces that kind of go up. And then 
um, I used a filter. So if you use contrast and blur filter, it makes this kind of like gooey effect. Lucas Beber is the one who um, kind of like popularized that with this, men this uh, gooey menu. So I can apply that to the uh, candle flame. And what's nice about Greensock is SVG filters are not anim animatable properties. That's not allowed in CSS land or anything. But Greensock doesn't care. It's like beautifully dumb. It just wants to change numbers. <laughs> so I can actually feed it a standard deviation of that blur node and it will actually change the kind of weight and the like substance of that filter. And that's why it kind of ebbs and flows like that. And the other thing that I'm doing here is I'm just Going through a simple for loop, I've named each one of those flame shapes, F1, F2, F3, F4, and then it just loops through those and morphs them. Um, so then, I, and I can also plot it on the timeline like this with a relative label. So, you know, you can get these like really interesting effects. But there's more than one way of working. Like you don't even have to build the same demo like I did because it's math and you can do whatever you want. Um, so. Uh, Blake Bowen had made these really cool things with like uh, taking a polyline and feeding it to a path and changing it based on a catmull rom spleen. So it kind of softens that path along the polyline. A catmull rom spleen is not invented by Blake. It's kind of an old concept in computer science. If you want to read more about it, there's an article here that's listed. Um, but basically, it's just like an array of points that you see here and here and here, and then it's like softening those points out. So if I wanted to, what I could have done is taken a bunch of different polyline path points, softened them, and then made them into you know, shapes that I was changing around, move those path points around. So that's a totally different way of working that would have also worked. And it's kind of similar to how I made this smoke, which is just like another kind of moving something in an elemental way. Oh. So design and information and animation, like put, let's put more concepts together. Um, if we're revisiting some old approaches, I, um, I think it's kind of interesting. I was like reading up about the infographic and um, there was this one source that was saying that they incre infographics increased traffic to their website by over 400%. It had lead increases by like thousands of percent, the number of new visitors to their site by almost 78%. There were more articles than this one too, like a bunch of articles like this. But all of these posts are older than two years old, and I haven't really seen that many infographics lately. So I was kind of wondering why. And I'm thinking about the problems, I guess like, uh, about two years ago, we had a tipping point with responsive where people working using social media were starting to use their phones more than they were their computers. Um, so if you think about the infographic on a phone, it becomes this terrible pinch and grab affair and you can't really see it. So it just wasn't really updated to that current context. And it really wasn't updated in design either. It kind of had that salon style that doesn't really fit with flat graphics like we use now. Um, so I created this pen. Ah, that thing is bothering me. Um, so, so these are like global warming solutions. And again, now that we're animating it, we can show pieces of information. We don't have to show the whole thing at once. So it goes through all of these different effectiveness levels. I can flip to different parts in the timeline by playing with it. I can replay it. And you have like the millions, billions, trillions. Some of these are really funny, actually. Like one of them is like, cover all the deserts in tinfoil. Um, <laughs> so, so you should actually read some of of these, um, but if we scale it down, again, it can like totally shift place and move, and it all works for responsive design as well. So what do we do here? Again, we're, we're, we're working with that view box. We've just got the larger view of the view box. This is a div that's placed like above it so that uh, screen readers can still traverse all of that text. And then we just make the smaller view a uh, different size for responsive and we can shift that point of view for people. Um, for responsive, I'm just using media queries. You already know all this stuff. You can totally do this. It's really, really easy. 
and uh, it's really accessible. You can do all sorts of accessibility stuff. Um, here, I think something that's worth calling out here is that I'm using ARIA labeled by title, and then you see title ID title. You actually do need that ID. Some JAWS devices and some other accessibility readers won't pick it up without that. Um, I just didn't know that for a while. Um, also, language EN is really important if you're Spanish or something and you have a screen reader. It helps translate it. Um, but this is just one way of working with accessibility for this demo, that this resource at the bottom by Heather is a, a woman who worked for us for CSS Tricks for this article. She went to the library every weekend for like a month and tested out every screen reader possible to write this article. It was like a, just a huge undertaking. So definitely make use of that resource because she put so much time into it and it's free to you. Motion along a path, we talked about how there's the widest support in Greensock. Um, uh, you know, it's one of the coolest things about Smile, but now it's, it's kind of gone. It's backwards compa compatible and even cross-browser, and it even works on IE. Um, all of this is stuff I just told you. <laughs> and um, you, Oh, here is the voting for motion, of, uh, motion along a path and edge. Uh, so there's the link to that. So I actually did include it. You can go vote on it. Um, so I was thinking about how you might animate um, some fireflies. So if we're looking at Greensock's way of doing this, we're just feeding in an array of path values, x, y, x, y, x, y. And fireflies do this kind of interesting thing where they like move around and then they like like pop up somewhere else. Like I was watching all these YouTube videos of fireflies and my fiance is like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so, you know, um, it, they have this kind of like very particular movement. They're kind of interesting to watch. So one thing that you might have noticed is that they're like curving around. They're not just like going here and then there and then here and then there. So there is actually like a malleable curviness factor there. To tell you the truth, we actually kind of talked about this already because what this uses under the hood is the Catmull ROM spleen. Um, so we're just using these paths as general coordinates and smoothing out the motion between them. You can set the, the type parameter to soft and Greensock will do all the work for you, or you can actually like change it and have a little bit more control here. So I made a demo to kind of demonstrate this. If it's set to zero, it will just go from one thing to the other. And if it's set to two, it'll kind of go around. So like two here, three here. So two is like super curvy. And then like if you get to eight, watch what happens. It kind of like unravels, which when I first saw it, I was thinking like, oh, it will get smoother and smoother and smoother. But no. Um, so what you're thinking about is if you think about each one of those like path points, those x, y values as being like little stakes, like little pegs, and then you think about this like this way of moving around them as a rubber band that's top that's pulled taut. So zero is pulled all the way taut. And then as it gets a little bit, as it gets to like two, it gets kind of rounded. But by the time you get to eight, that rubber band's just kind of like curling around itself. That's kind of what I used to think about it. So interaction, let's talk about some cool things we can do with interaction. Um, when we're working with you know, the spec and stuff, what we have available to us is a thing called transform origin. Um, but when we're working with SVG, sometimes we want to have something like work right into the middle of SVG. So Greensock offers a thing called SVG origin. So I can take this cow, his transform origin, if it was 50-50, would be like right in the middle of that cow. But I can make him jump over the moon and scare this little astronaut guy, but I'm not good at throwing him. Um, <laughs> and, and every time he goes around, he's going around that center point of the SVG. So that's a really nice offering from Greensock. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but it's also worth mentioning that whole SVG is only two kilobytes. That's pretty fun. There's so much you can do with just so little information. <laughs> So um, when I first built this, what I decided to do was put this like like null object, this like thing you couldn't see in the middle, and then you know maybe have like a, a test to see if he was hitting the you know the top of that guy's head, but it was firing all the time, and I couldn't figure out why. So what's actually happening is that line is not just like a line that goes around in the DOM. What you can see here is this is the way that DOM reads this lined object. 
it's going to always be this giant rectangle. So it was like almost constantly hitting the astronaut's head, and I had to figure out a different way of making that fire. So this is what the dom actually sees. That circle is spinning too. You can't really see it. But if you put the bounding box stroke on it, you can see how the DOM is actually seeing those elements. I thought I would just mention that because like, if you're going to do any crazy like video game kind of like, it hits the thing and goes pow, which you can totally do in SVG, um, you should watch out for this. So another kind of like fun interaction thing, we can kind of pair some of the things we've already learned with sound and, and stuff. Can you actually hear? No. No. Oh, OK. Oh, wait. Here we go. So I'm just pressing different keys and affecting different timelines, and you can make anything really happen. I think my favorite is this balloon. So that, you know, it's like, we'll keep doing that. And they're going to keep shifting colors and stuff. So one thing that's kind of fun to call out is that balloon. So what, basically, in order to make a circle, all you need is a radius, a CX, and a CY. It's plotting it along the SVG coordinates. So I make the radius bigger, and I make the CY, or the CY smaller, so it makes it look like it's getting bigger and going up, kind of. And then once it gets to a certain you know, radius, then I all of a sudden play this timeline, most of which you can't see, but some of which you can. And then I have a set timeout function that returns it to its original state. So just by playing around with it and you know, being a little creative, you can have cool effects. It's probably not a good pen to show right now with the political climate. That I, I did not make this today. I made it a while ago. Um, <laughs> But um, so the way that this is done is, again, with those SVG filters that I kind of mentioned before. But um, because we're talking about performance and we're talking about um, some of the things that we have to do for performance, SVG filters can be a little performance insensitive. So what I have here is a timeline call to ha use this helper function to add the attribute. Then I can you know, tween that, that attribute of the base frequency of a distortion filter. But then I immediately call this other function that removes it. So I have these helper functions that are like setting it immediately to zero and then removing it as soon as possible so that I don't affect the performance of any of the rest of that. So if you're going to work with SVG filters and animation and you're like, oh, it looks weird for the rest of the time, um, that's, that's what I actually suggest is to like add the attribute and then remove it. So one of the last things I'm going to talk about is state-driven SVG animation. I'm a big fan of Vue.js. It's kind of like React or Angular, but it's really, really elegant and just a really beautiful piece of technology. Um, and what's really nice about it is that I can encapsulate what's changing and write my animations in a really declarative manner. So if I have this like weather notifier, What we can do here is we can have state-driven animation, and I can have each one of them in a template that I'm actually, every single time it enters and every single time it leaves, it belongs to that template. And I'm actually not even throwing the state around. I'm using a thing called Vuex, which is close to Redux, if, you're com if you like, are more familiar with that. So I have this general store, and I ha I'm toggling the state on and off, but I'm also advancing that template in one centralized location. So it makes it really, really nice and easy to work with and very clean. So I don't even have to like attach the animation to it and have timelines if I don't want to. I can work with watchers or observables or RxJx. And here I'm using Vue.js to like write an SVG chart because I, without it, like another D3 library or anything. Because if you know SVG, you can do that pretty easily with these frameworks. And then I'm just watching that state change and actually using that to animate. And that's also how I made this Wally. -E. 
because he's kind of like looking for his cockroach friend and he'll, you know, reach out for him. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I'm showing you just like a little piece of it, but in the HTML, in the view component, I'm saying at mass move coordinates, and then I'm creating a method that's called coordinates passing in the event, and I'm setting that timeline progress along the coordinates of those at that event. Um, I wrote a book, and it is not this book. This is my friend trolling me. I don't have the man blob animal. That's not even my last name. Um, <laughs> I, did, I, I did write this book, though. <laughs> it's called SVG Animations. I think they're going to give away a couple copies tonight. Um, and I'm really excited. This is actually the first time I'm seeing it in person. Um, I like ran up to the table and like held it, and I think scared people. Um, <laughs> spent two years writing it. If you liked any of the things that you saw um, and want to know more about how they were made or want to make them yourself, uh, get a copy. And um, yeah. Thank you.